Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's space science class. We're going to be talking about space and science and science and space. I'm James. If you haven't attended one of my classes before, um, I tend to run long. I talk too much and I don't go fast enough on my slides. And I take way too many questions from all of you. And I plan on doing exactly that again today. If you have attended my classes in the past, welcome back. Okay. Oh, I don't have my space helmet. Hang on just a second. There we go. Ah, Got to start with the space helmet. My, uh, my patch is kind of falling off. This helmet needs some more work. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to have to do some work on that again at some point here. So today we are going to be talking about space technology that we use every day. Did you know that you're using space technology? right now you probably are and we're gonna learn more about what are some of the things that we use that you might not even think have any connection to space or space technology research and development okay let us look in the q a section see who we've got here today a bunch of people saying hello and good morning and hi hello everyone i promised i would bring benjamin did i bring benjamin is Benjamin here? I might have returned Benjamin to his home. Just a moment. Ah, I'm the worst. Okay, Thursday, Benjamin will be here with us for our grand finale. So today we're talking about technology that we use from space and space development. Thursday, we are going to be talking about what it takes to colonize our solar system. And Benjamin is our first colonist because nothing bad can happen to him. So uh, he will be here. He'll be wearing the space helmet. You have my word. <laughs> oh boy, I'm, I'm taking a beating in the Q&A section. <laughs> uh, you, you guys are totally right. You are not wrong. I just, I, I let you down on that one. So I'm gonna have to make that up to you. My apologies. Uh, here's a picture of our school, and I'll bet you're wondering where we are, where we're broadcasting from, right down over there. Uh, this is where our webinar studio is, and uh, that's where we've been broadcasting to you from these last several weeks or months or however long it's been. And uh, whenever you all are able to come and visit the school in person, uh, you'll have a better idea of where it is. Okie doke. So we're talking about NASA spin-offs, space spin-offs. Ta-da! So a spin-off is something that started as part of a larger whole and then became its own thing separately. Um, you know, there's some TV shows that are spin-offs from other ones. There was a you know, a cartoon series that I watched and there was one section of that cartoon series called Animaniacs. And then Animaniacs became their whole new show, their own thing. Uh, so this happens in technology development as well. Someone will develop something, have an idea for a product and they'll make it. And then someone else will be like, hey, we can use it for this or that or the other thing. And it spins off and it becomes its own thing. Okay, so here's this uh, website. If you just Google NASA space spinoffs, you'll find this website. And the NASA Technology Transfer Program is a part of NASA that is specifically looking at how to take what they're developing there and put it into everyday use. So uh, this, uh, this publication, this website, documents these things and makes it available for people to see you know what has been what has come from space and that we can now use there's been almost 2000 technologies since 1976 that have been put into public use after being developed for space flight we're going to take a look at some of those you might be wondering what's happening here don't worry i was wondering too when i first saw this image there are machines that they developed, products that NASA developed to test um, 
like balance and coordination for astronauts and stuff like that. Um, after an astronaut has been in space for a period of time, there's certain things that start to break down. Their, their sense of up and down, you know, that can be a little uh, unstable because up and down hasn't really existed for them in space. Everything's just kind of floating. Um, they lose muscle mass, they lose bone mass, bo bone density. Um, the body starts to break down. Even though they're exercising for like two hours a day, it's still, um, you know, you don't realize how much you exercise your body every day just by walking, just by getting out of bed and walking to the fridge, you know, and getting some cereal, you're exercising your body because you have to move the legs and all this stuff and there's gravity that you're pushing against. So here's this device. They can put the astronaut in it and kind of suspend them and help them uh, regain their balance, help them rebuild muscle mass and stuff like that, kind of take some of the weight off of them. Uh, this can be very useful for, um, for elderly patients or patients that are recovering from an accident. Let's, let's say someone was in a, um, a traffic accident and they haven't been able to use their legs a lot and they need to build up the muscle in their legs again, but they're not strong enough to stand. Here's this thing, this device that can kind of hold them up a bit as they work on that. Okay. Uh, here is another thing. You have this person, she is suspended um, in this machine here, in this contraption. And you can see she's on a treadmill and it's used to kind of uh, keep some of the weight up off of the treadmill and, and make it easier for her to run. But she's still able to get that kind of um, exercise in there without having as much stress on her legs, as not as much stress on her knees you can build back up on a gradient instead of having to run on your legs, on your knees, and it can be painful if your legs aren't in the best shape for it. Um, there's other ways to do this on earth. Uh, I've seen a, a lot of athletes will use um, treadmills underwater. They'll be in like a small pool um, and there will be a treadmill under there and they're, and they're holding on to something and they're walking on the treadmill and the water is helping keep them lighter. So it's easier for, you know, if they're recovering from a knee surgery or something like that. Uh, obviously in space, you can't just have a big puddle of water. You can't have a big pool of water in space. So something like this helps, um, helps with that. Okay. Gradient, uh, Kat is asking, what does gradient mean? A gradient is a, a gradual moving from one thing to another, right? If you have the color, white over here and the color black over here and you have a gradual transition from what what i say this was white or black <laughs> let's say you have white and then it's like a light gray and then a darker gray darker gray darker gray and then black on this end it goes in a gradient in in progressive steps a, a little bit darker a little bit darker a little bit darker or if you were practicing um running and the easiest gradient of running would be running on a flat surface. And then if you wanted to move to the higher gradient, the higher step, the higher level of challenge, you would run on something that had a little bit of a slope to it. And then the next gradient, the next level of challenge would be a little bit more of a slope, a little bit more of a slope. Um, yeah. All right. VS is asking, can't we make artificial gravity using the force of spinning. It's called centrifugal force, he said. Uh, yes, centrifugal force, you can take something and you can spin it around in a circle like this and the force of being flung outward like that creates outward gravity, artificial gravity. We can absolutely do that. It's a very simple way to do that. There are no spacecraft right now that use that uh, to create artificial gravity many concepts for that. And on Thursday, when we talk about how to colonize the solar system, we're going to, we're going to look at different ways of using that spinning to generate artificial gravity. But right now we don't have any spacecraft that do that. Um, 
So we have to we have to find other ways to cheat. We have to find other ways around it. All right. This is the first thing that always pops into my mind when I think of technology developed for space that we now use every day. I could not find my local coffee shop without this. I would be lost in a city. I would be lost in the country without GPS, Global Positioning System. And all GPS is using satellites that are up in space. Um, the global GPS network is largely maintained and funded by the United States military. It takes billions of dollars a year. I think it's like $3 billion a year to keep this network of satellites up and running. And, you know, I guess I'm okay with that because we use it all the time. And uh, you need to have satellites up there. And we know exactly where this, the satellites are. They are parked in very specific points above our planet and they rotate exactly in time with our planet. They don't move in our sky relative to what we can see. So when you take your phone and you start looking up and it can, we satellite knows exactly where it is. It can see your signal, where it's, where your signal is coming from. And it knows, okay, you're exactly in that direction. Now that might be a little imprecise. It knows what direction you're in, but it doesn't know how far you are. So we use another satellite and that satellite starts looking as well. And you've got a satellite here, here, and here. If you've got three of those points and all three, like one of them knows that you're this way, one knows that you're this way, one knows that you're this way, all three points meet right here and it knows exactly where you are. Um, GPS can be a little bit fuzzy, a little bit vague. It can be like, well, we know he's within this mile down here. We know he's around this, this mile. Uh, or it can be very precise. We know he, he is within this meter. He, we're at least within like three feet of where he is right now. Uh, but yeah, GPS technology started with the military developing it in space to keep track of their submarines and different pieces of you know, military hardware that they have on the planet. And now we use it to find our next coffee shop. All right. Oh, Tanisha's asking, is Delphine a, a, a real school, not just an online school? Yes, uh, popping back here, uh, this, this is our school. This is a uh, day and boarding school. There's, um, there's kids here from kindergarten through 12th grade, not boarding as young as kindergarten. Um, you can board here starting around middle school, but a lot of high school students and there's students here almost all, all year round. And um, yeah, but when everything started going on in the spring, March and April hit and schools were closing down and a lot of kids were stuck at home, we were like, hey, we've got stuff that we can help with. We can help kids continue their education, continue learning at home. So we started up these webinars. Okay. So GPS, that's obviously my favorite one. Um, electrolytes. If you in these hot days here have, you know, gotten some drink with powdered electrolytes in it, you take like a little tablet and you pop it in your water and it fizzes or you have a powder and you mix it in and you drink it. And that was developed by NASA for keeping astronauts hydrated. Um, you can get dehydrated in space. You can, you, you can experience low blood pressure. Astronauts can get dizzy, they can get lightheaded, maybe faint if it gets too bad. So, they were finding that they needed to give the astronauts more electrolytes, more of these um, minerals and versions of energy that you get kind of naturally here on the planet, but they wanted more. Uh, so it took some work to develop it, but once they developed it, they realized, hey, we can take these you know, things that the body needs, put them in a powder, stick it in water and drink it, that's very easily made available to the public. And now we have stuff like powdered electrolytes and emergency and all this stuff. 
I don't know about you guys, but I would much rather have one of these thermometers taking my temperature. We just kind of boop, scan my head real quick and we know what my temperature is. Instead of having to sit there with a the thermometer, put it on, under my tongue. Modern thermometers, it only takes a couple of seconds to find out what your temperature is. Back in the days, it took minutes, several minutes sometimes, and you didn't even know it was done. You just had to wait for the, for the, for it to stop moving. And then you're, no, okay, well, looks like, uh, you know, I have a fever. Uh, this is way better. It's way quicker, but it took some work to develop. And this was originally developed as part of space exploration, space technology. Like we need to know how hot it is in that room right now, or how hot is that air? Or what temperature is that metal? We can scan it with this thermometer without touching it and find out how hot. All right. So these, these are really cool. When the early astronauts were landing um, in the Mercury and Gemini and Apollo programs from the United States, Russia had most of their astronaut, astronauts come back and land on land in the middle of, of the continent there. And um, so they had their own ways of landing them. America was like, hey, it's great to splash them into the water. It's nice and gentle and calm usually calm, um, you know, it's soft, it cushions their landing, but they didn't want the astronauts to drown. So they developed these inflatable rafts that the astronauts could climb into and, you know, just kind of hang out there until the, re until the recovery boats came. Well, the company that developed those and, um, and the scientists that work on them at NASA were like, this, this is great. There's so many other uses we could have for these inflatable very strong and durable rafts. Um, so they started selling them to, I mean, especially the, the United States Coast Guard, but also just, you know, sailors in general. Like if you have a ship, it's great to have some really good life rafts with you. So um, these rafts are designed so that they cannot be capsized. They can't be flipped in rough seas or heavy winds or anything like that. So if you're in trouble, your ship goes down in a storm, you can pop one of these rafts, climb in, seal it up, and you're gonna be thrown around on the water, but you're not gonna drown. And you can see they're very bright, they're easily spotted from the air. Um, they probably have some, some stuff in them that makes the water around you turn like a bright yellow. It's very easy to see. Um, there we go. There's different sizes. This looks like a, like a one-person raft. And these ones look a bit bigger. You could fit several people in there. Very, very useful. Uh, oh, BS is asking, where does the spacecraft debris go? Does it go into the water? Uh, yeah, a lot of leftover stuff from rocket launches ends up in the ocean. Um, you know, the United States, they, most of the missions are launched from Florida. It takes off from Florida and it goes off over the Atlantic Ocean. So as parts of the rocket separate and fall away, they fall into the Atlantic Ocean and usually they're just abandoned. They just sink there. Um, they know where the rocket's going to be flying. They know where things are expected to kind of crash down. And um, like the Air Force and the Navy will set up a path in the water where they tell like, they tell airplanes don't fly here during this time because we're launching a rocket. They tell boats stay away from here so you don't the odds of getting hit by like a part of a rocket coming down are super, super small. But it just makes sense to keep people away from the area. Um, some American launches happen from the West Coast, from just north of Los Angeles. And those ones tend to go out over the Pacific Ocean, again, safely. Um, Russian launches will go over a bunch of land before they cross the ocean but the land that it's crossing is not very populated. There's not a lot of people there. They know that they can safely have stuff crashing down without, without a big chance of hitting anyone. All right. Uh, Lolita is asking, what happens if suddenly there's a big storm while the astronauts are in the water? One of the many jobs that happen at NASA or any other space agency is monitoring the weather watching the weather very, very closely because that they, 
for exactly that reason. You don't want your astronauts to come down, be hanging out in the water, and a hurricane comes through and causes a bunch of problems. So they know what the weather looks like in the area that they're going to be landing. It's not that the astronauts just come back to Earth and crash wherever. They know they can guide very exactly where they're going. They can land. Used to be they would be able to land within a few miles of a target zone. Now you can land much more precisely than that. Um, so they know what the weather is. And if the weather looks bad, they might delay the astronauts returning. They might say, okay, you're gonna land this evening instead of this morning because the storm will be gone or we'll need to wait a day. Or they could just land somewhere else. Hey, right here, there's a storm, but 400 miles to the north, it's fine. And you can land there instead of down here. So yeah. PS is asking, doesn't that harm ocean life to have stuff crashing down into the ocean? Uh, yeah, if you're a fish and you're swimming along and you look up and there's a rocket coming right for you and you're gonna think, this is not how I expected my day to go. Yes, uh, it is harmful to whatever's in the way when it crashes down. But the ocean is a big enough place. Um, there's a trade-off with any kind of technology like this. You know, there's a trade-off with cars. We know that it's going to, you know, chipmunks and squirrels and deer and stuff are going to be hit by cars as we drive along. There's just kind of no avoiding that. Um, they get in the way of our machines, our machines get in the way of wildlife, and it's an unfortunate side effect. Same thing with planes flying through the air. Occasionally, they'll hit some birds. Um, spacecraft might land on a fish. Um, it's just a trade-off that we have to make. And while it's not great, we can at least be responsible and design our spacecraft in a way that it will create the least amount of impact. Like, don't have a ton of really nasty chemicals on the spacecraft that'll leak into the water and poison a bunch of stuff around it, you know? All right. Oh, Gail is asking a great question here. Why don't they just land the rocket? Well, uh, they do now sometimes. Um, it wasn't until about five, six years ago that anyone was able to do that successfully. You have a rocket that launches. Here, let's pop here real quick. You know, you've got the bottom part of the rocket, which is the first stage, was just a bunch of fuel in a big can that they used to toss the other stuff up in the air. So as it's launching, as the first stage starts to run out of fuel, it will separate off and the rest of the rocket keeps going up. And this part usually would just crash down into the ocean. Uh, SpaceX now has been able to get their technology good enough that they can take that rocket and turn it around, fly it back, and land it. Or sometimes it'll be flying, and it'll keep flying, and they'll have a ship out here that'll catch it, and it'll come down and it'll land on the ship. Uh, it's a new technology. It's, a not, it's not a new idea. We've seen in movies and TV shows for decades that rocket, you know, spaceships come in and land, and then they take off. That's just what spaceships do, like a car or a plane but it's hard to do, but they're figuring it out. And a lot of people are very interested in doing that because it means you get to use that rocket again, which saves a lot of money. So there's a lot of good reasons. It's just, it's just difficult. <clears throat> it's a good engineering challenge. <clears throat> okay. Good. VS is saying, uh, can't we set up nets in the ocean to catch the, the debris where the spacecraft crash lands? Kind of like a large net and the rocket lands in the middle. Uh, they're trying that too. That idea of a big net? Yes. And they have those big nets on ships. So as parts of it are coming down, uh, again, this is SpaceX trying this out. And they've been trying for years to do this. And only just earlier this year did they finally succeed in catching a part of the rocket on this big net on, on a ship. So part of the, the rocket will be coming down. Uh, they put a parachute on that piece. So it's kind of floating down and there's a ship with a giant net and the ship flies under <laughs> the piece of the rocket on a parachute and it catches it. Uh, it's really cool, really, really cool. Okay, uh, Ethan's saying my image is kind of laggy. 
I'm, I'm sorry if it's laggy. There's not a lot I can do to fix that. I just, I hope that the connection gets stronger here. All right, uh, Milo's asking, what if there are sharks that eat the rafts? Well, these rafts are designed to be uh, as puncture proof as possible. They're very strong and a shark, unless it's super starving, a shark isn't gonna be interested in biting something that doesn't look like food. Uh, you know, just a giant circle on the surface doesn't look like food to a shark. You know, if there's a, you know, arms and legs and it's moving, the shark might think it's food, but it doesn't look like food. It doesn't smell like food, doesn't act like food. It's probably not food. Uh, just like you are probably not going to go take a bite out of a life raft, you know, um, I don't think the shark will either. Okay, so here's a guy with a glove and he, with his glove, he's poking that needle. That's not safe. That's not smart. You don't poke needles. Uh, you, you don't poke your finger with needles. But the glove that he's wearing is of a rather light but super strong puncture resistant material, which is very useful in space. As they were developing the airbags that they used to land many of the, the rovers on Mars, which we talked about in a class a couple of weeks ago, you know, this is giant airbags and you just drop your rover onto Mars and it bounces on the airbags, comes to a stop, the airbags deflate and your rover basically drives out. But the airbags needed to be light and they needed to be able to extend, withstand extreme temperatures and not get poked by all the rocks. The rocks are sharp and you don't want the airbags to pop or get a hole and deflate. So they needed to be super strong and able to not get punctured. Well, hey, we can use that same material, use it here on Earth for protective gloves or for firefighting equipment or for, I mean, you know, like there's jobs that are dangerous that are near sharp tools. And, you know, if you're mining, you don't wanna be poking your hands with your tools or with the rocks. So you can use that material that was developed by NASA for everyday stuff. Okay. Uh, oh, I don't know what this material is called. Um, let me see if I have it in my notes somewhere. No, I don't have the note of what exactly this is called. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I don't know about you guys, but <clears throat> I definitely have a strip of these LED lights up in, in my room now. They look awesome. They're really cool. They don't get hot. So there's no risk of them starting a fire from getting too hot. Um, they can change colors super easily and they take very, very little electricity to operate. Uh, there's a billion reasons to love them. And they were, LEDs were first discovered by engineers doing research for space science. LED stands for light emitting diode. It emits light, it's a diode, it's a kind of crystal there. And when electricity is put into the crystal, it glows. Very simple and very safe and awesome. And you can use it to generate exact wavelengths of light. So the light that you're gonna get from an LED is very different from the light that you're gonna get from like a light bulb, your normal uh, incandescent light bulb with the gas in it. And you've got the little wire that stretches across inside the bulb and the, the wire heats up and that makes the glass, the, the, the gas glow inside. Very different technology, but they both create light. I love these things. These are great. And now they're super cheap. Um, <clears throat> and it's cheap because this technology was discovered. Um, they just kind of stumbled across it and were like, hey, that's cool, we can use this. Uh, NASA put time and money into researching it. And then it was like, it's super easy to create LEDs. It's super easy to power them. Turned out to be just a great, very simple technology. Okay. <clears throat> and I, I've seen these, these were a little bit more expensive just a few years ago. In the last five years, they've gotten super, super 
cheap. Um, I just want to define the word diode there, light emitting diode. A diode is a device that allows electricity to flow through it, usually in one direction. So these things, electricity comes in one side of the little, you can think of it like a bulb, that crystal of material, and it goes out the other side and the electricity passing through it just makes it glow. Super cool. All right. <laughs> we have someone asking, what is the International Space Station? I don't, I don't think I have a copy, a, an image of that in my slides here. Let's see if I can make one, if, if I can find one and toss it in here a little bit later. Um, here we have tents, uh, you know, just tents. This, is, this might be for like a music festival or something like that. Uh, but the material that these big tents can be made out of today, tents used to be made of canvas, you know, like a, like a heavy cloth, similar to what they would use for sails on an old sailing ship. Uh, but you have this, um, this new material now developed in the Apollo program to be used in space flight. It's more durable, it's stronger, uh, it's more lightweight, it's more flexible, it doesn't catch on fire or it's harder for it to catch on fire, way, way better than using like a cloth canvas material. Um, so after they developed that to help get astronauts to and from space, they're like, hey, we can make this available to the public. Everyone can use this. There we go. Um, what's next here? <gasps> Headsets. <laughs> I love a good wireless headset, uh, Bluetooth, um, it's, you'd have these astronauts up in these, uh, spacecraft and they'd have a headset on and there'd be like, you know, wires dangling and getting caught and stuff. And you try to go over here to, you know, touch the switch and the wires pulling on you. Not as great. You want to have a wireless disconnected thing. So you're not getting tangled up in it. Uh, so they started developing that technology for astronauts. Now, Bluetooth, I said Bluetooth. Bluetooth is its own separate type of wireless technology. That's its own thing. I don't think that the development of Bluetooth was part of space engineering development. I could be wrong on that, but I'm, from what I remember, Bluetooth was its own thing. Uh, but Bluetooth is only one kind of wireless connection technology. There's many others. And so, some of these first wireless headsets were developed by a company called Plantronics to make headsets for NASA astronauts. And, you know, now I've got this, this is a, this is the headset that I have at my desk in my office. And it's made by the same company uh, that made those original wireless headsets for spacecraft. So yeah, I have space technology in my office. It's pretty cool. Uh, braces and better ways to straighten your teeth without having a giant metal contraption. Uh, used to be if you needed to correct the alignment of your teeth, you, it would be a bigger piece of gear. There would be kind of like a metal frame that would go around your head that would support the things that are moving your teeth into, in, into place. Um, this was a completely accidental development of material. Uh, what they were trying to do was to create a new protective dome for a radar device, you know, so that uh, it would protect the, the radar from, from the air and from stuff coming in. And, you know, so it didn't get dust and rocks and water on it and stuff like that, but they, it needed to be clear so that the radar could see out. Uh, one of the materials that they developed in testing this out turned out to be not great for the radar thing that they were trying to build. Um, but it had other uses too. They were like, hey, what if we put this radar shield stuff on our teeth? <laughs> That's a very simple way of describing it. But, you know, we, we're, we're used to seeing these Invisalign things now 
It's a very strong um, plastic sort of material that you know, really hold its shape and you can use it to help mold your teeth into the right shape. Um, even on something like, there we go, I'm kind of pointing, my finger will go off camera here. <laughs> even braces like that use this material and it replaces this big bulky metal structure that they used to have for braces. Okay. Memory foam. I don't know if you have a memory foam on, on top of your mattress or on your pillow, but it was originally developed because these astronauts would sit in these seats as they're being launched up to and coming back from space. And they'll be sitting there for hours and hours and hours sometimes. And you don't want your astronauts to be too uncomfortable. So they developed a material that would cushion them. And, and it would, um, and then, you know, it kind of remembers the shape that you press into it for a bit. So an astronaut lays in there and it molds to the shape of his, uh, the shape of his body, the shape of his back, and it really helps make them more comfortable for that journey. Uh, just another picture of memory foam there. Good stuff. Um, fire is a big risk in space flight. You, you know, Apollo 1, there were three astronauts that uh, passed away after there was a fire in their spacecraft. It wasn't even flying. It was on the ground. They were just doing tests and a fire broke out. So um, NASA is very interested in having good fireproof or at least fire resistant materials that their astronauts can wear um, during operations. They, they don't wear these flight resistant suits all the time. It, they wear it when they're launching, they wear it when they're landing, they wear it if they're doing something up in space that might be kind of dangerous. Um, so that if something does go wrong, the spacecraft, you know, let's say the spacecraft is re-entering the atmosphere and it gets too hot and it starts getting too hot for to be comfortable inside, the astronauts in their flight suits can have some more protection from that. All that material, we can use that for firefighters. You know, space technology works everywhere, not just in space. So firefighters have better equipment, it's safer, it's more reliable than it used to be, but it takes time and money to research that kind of stuff. Space research. All right, so VS is saying, can't you just purge the air in that part of the spacecraft? So to, to stop a fire, yes, if you remove all the air, a fire will put itself out. That's really good. Um, but that's not always possible. And that might not always be the right thing to do. Some of these spacecraft, um, it's one way to do it, but it's not the only way. And if you do just like blow all the air out of your spacecraft, that might create more problems for you. Maybe, you're, um, maybe your helmet isn't fully sealed or one of your crewmates wasn't able to get their helmet fully on. Uh, most spacecraft, all spacecraft, I think, don't have a system built in where they can just pump all the air out. That would be something that would have to be specifically designed. Um, even if you did have that, it's good to have multiple ways of solving one problem. Um, for example, those astronauts on Earth um, in the Apollo 1 capsule, even if they opened the hatch, um, there would, there's air outside, there's oxygen outside. So let's say you know, your spacecraft comes in and lands. Um, you can't just open the door and let all the air go out into space because now you're on land and the fire would still continue. So it's, it's great to have more than one way to solve any problem, especially in space. All right. Oh, Gail's asking, why do firefighters wear hats? If you're in a, a building, you're in a burning building, I mean, for one thing, you want to protect your head from the heat, and, and that's really good. But also, the building is burning, stuff is going to start falling down. And you, you don't want it to fall and injure your head. So the helmet protects the head and you see there's that kind of lip around the back there that protects the back of the neck as well. Eleanor was asking about, uh, wasn't there one journey 
Oh, wasn't there a spacecraft that blew up? Uh, yes, unfortunately. Um, in 1986, the space shuttle Challenger um, blew up as it was taking off. Blew up about 80 seconds into launch, I think it was. Um, and, we, and we lost the seven astronauts on board of that. And then in 2004, the space shuttle Columbia, as it was re-entering the atmosphere, uh, something went wrong and it burned up on re-entry. We lost those astronauts as well. Space flight, space travel, space exploration is a very dangerous business. Exploration has always been dangerous. You know, the first guy that got on a log and paddled out, you know, out you know, off the site of land, you know, those early sailors, even late sailors, like there's shipwrecks happen every year. Um, exploration is dangerous, um, especially the early ones that do it. Many of the first people that tried to, to climb Mount Everest did not survive the journey. Many of the first sailors were lost at sea. Many of the first people hiking, you know, trying to explore the wilderness in a new part of the world, uh, it, it's dangerous. And all that was really dangerous on a planet that we are specifically adapted to survive on. <laughs> we're supposed to live here. This is like, we're made to live on Earth and it's still dangerous. Going out into space, space is not designed to support human life. Human life is not designed to live in space. So we, we have to artificially create everything and bring everything with us. Something goes wrong, there's no backup. You can't just open the door and leave the spacecraft and you know your, your house burns down on Earth, you walk down the road and you get help. You can build another house. You can't do that in space. So it's much less forgiving, it's much more dangerous, which is why it makes sense to have these huge teams involved in the process, to have someone who can develop a new kind of fire resistant material so that let's say you're running low on air and you can't just blow the air out of your uh, spacecraft to put out the fire. Uh, a lot of speculation on my part here, but yeah. Okay. All right, someone's asking, has anyone gotten lost in space, like floated off from the spacecraft and never retrieved again is what I think you're asking. No, thankfully, no, that would be a horrible way to go. Um, any astronaut that goes outside of their spacecraft <coughs> is, going to be, is going to be tethered to the spacecraft. They're gonna have safety lines connected, uh, more than one, at least two. Um, there have been a couple of times when astronauts have gone out not connected to their spacecraft. Uh, there was one time they were specifically testing this new kind of maneuvering pack. The guy was wearing this kind of jet pack basically and he maneuvered out and he floated quite a ways away, I think several dozen meters away from the spacecraft and turned around and came back just to test like, hey, does this work? <laughs> but they knew that that was extremely risky. This was a very highly competent, skilled professional taking a huge risk in the interest of testing a new technology. Okay. So, um, shoes, we all wear them. They, the shoes now, especially running shoes, athletic shoes, they're lightweight, they're durable, they're breathable. Um, there's, they're, they're way better than the shoes 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There's materials and designs and concepts being developed for space exploration. They can use those lightweight, more durable materials in everyday products like shoes. Um, great stuff. Artificial limbs. Uh, you know, there's, there's people who need to have an artificial arm or leg and we're able to use, again, a lot of this is the, the basic materials that have been developed for space exploration. Um, you know, NASA didn't develop an artificial limb, but they developed, they helped develop a stronger, more lightweight metal, a stronger, more lightweight plastic, uh, materials that work better, um, that are easier on the skin where the artificial limb will connect to, you know, to the arm or to the leg. And other people can take those materials and design all kinds of stuff with them, like a leg. Solar panels. All right. 
here's the thing. Solar panels were a lot of the original development and research for them was done in order to power spacecraft. They're up in space. There's a lot of strong sunshine. You just fold out a panel of, of solar panels and you can get free energy from the sun. So um, space uh, solar panels have gotten better and better and better over the years. They're easier produ to produce. They're cheaper. They're far more efficient. You can get more energy from the sun per square inch of solar panel than ever before. And it's just going to keep getting better. And a lot of that was, a lot of that research was powered by NASA and other space communities. Uh, we're pretty much out of time here. I'm going to really quickly flip through the last few slides here. Space blankets, obviously, uh, made for space. It's a very thin, very, 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 very thin material, but it's extremely good at insulating, keeping heat in or cold out. And they use them to coat spacecraft. You want the spacecraft to stay at the right temperature. It helps the spacecraft not get super cold or too hot. Uh, scratch resistant coating on lenses. I am so grateful that this technique was developed as part of space exploration and engineering to make it harder to scratch my glasses. Dustbuster, these little handheld vacuums that you can get, super common, super normal. It was actually considered one of the best inventions of the 20th century. Um, it was originally designed to pick up rocks on the moon, to vacuum up rocks that were interesting. Uh, cameras, camera technology. If you've ever taken a picture with your phone, you are using space technology. Um, you know, I show selfies specifically just because they're great, but uh, all that camera development, um, you know, photography research and stuff like that in order to make these super small, lightweight, but very powerful cameras, it's exactly what you need in space. And now we get to use it to make TikToks. Um, let's see, we're, we're just, I don't have a lot of time left. We're going to have to skip the rest of this stuff, but some of the next things that I'm going to be getting into are possible technologies that we could use to colonize the moon, Mars, other things in our solar system. So that's a perfect place to end because this is where we're going to pick up on Thursday for our next and last, for now, space science class. Thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, I, let's see, let me just click to the end here really quick. Okay, good. A huge thank you to, uh, let's see, Heron Books. <laughs> My finger disappears right about there. To Heron Books for uh, helping uh, to provide a lot of the material that I borrow from and teach from in these classes. If you want to be more involved in space science, space engineering, space development, a lot of the best, most exciting jobs for the next several decades are going to be coming in this field. You want to have a strong basis, a strong grounding in math and science, and everything kind of flows from there. If you don't have math and science down pat, really good, you, you, you're not going to have a career in the space field. Um, and I think it'd be re really cool to do that. So there's plenty of curriculum available at heronbooks.com that you can, uh, you can go there, look through, find a subject or a level of a subject that interests you, buy it online and continue your education, no matter what's happening in the world, whether your school is open or not, you can continue your, your education. Thank you so much. I'm going to stick around for a few minutes in the Q and A section and answer stuff by text. And I will see you on Thursday.